This is Harvard on the Map, presented by the Harvard Graduate School of Design, covering innovative ideas and thought leaders in digital cartography, earth observation, and all things geospatial, with your host, Jennifer Horowitz. Hello, and welcome to Harvard on the Map. I'm here with Dan B. Lee, who's a senior product manager on the Geodata platform at Niantic. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so let's hop in. I'm super curious. Can you take us through a little bit of your geospatial journey in terms of how you ended up finding yourself at Niantic? Yeah, um, so I'm a bit of a nomad. Um, I actually uh, thought when I was in college that I was going to um, save the earth and I actually studied environmental science with a degree in um, natural resources management and plant biology and all that fun stuff which I still very much uh, enjoy reading about and thinking about um, and that was my first introduction to GIS so this is like arc info days um, <laughs> very rudimentary like and then it was like arc just one or whatever i don't even remember it was years and years ago um and uh i i ended up actually um jumping right into a master's in urban planning so after i graduated um <clears throat> i kind of started getting interested in urban studies uh urban planning urban design you know how how we how the questions are on like how, how do we build up our world and what is the impact of that on how societies are shaped and using using data to understand that and um yeah i, I just threw my hat in the ring for a master's study at a university in, in, i'm canadian so it was, in, it was at dalhousie in halifax so yeah i was like you know i threw my hat in the ring i said maybe i can do a master's in urban planning and i uh, I got accepted and um, I, I moved from Ontario to, to Nova Scotia, which is beautiful, by the way, if anyone's listening or is from there, um, please do visit. Um, and I was I was studying to get my master's in urban planning and I was still very much interested in GIS. So I was always trying to use geospatial data uh, throughout my studies there. Um, I didn't finish that degree. <laughs> I actually, I don't know, I just, it wasn't the right program for me. And um, I moved back to Toronto and uh, I got a job right away as a junior urban planner, um, working for um, uh, two, two really brilliant people, uh, Jennifer um, Kiesmatt, uh, who, who later became the chief planner of Toronto, um, and Antonio Gomez Palacio. And um, they're really great mentors and sort of allowed me to play around with GIS um, through all of our urban design and urban planning uh, projects. Um, and so I was always sort of keeping my toes in there, but I was thinking about technology, spatial, geospatial technology and how that could impact um, um, the way we make decisions in urban planning. And I did that for uh, about four years. It was um, really fun. Uh, um, a lot of work. We were a very small boutique like urban planning firm. Um, and there was a point where I just decided, you know what, I want to, I want to dive deeply into the technology and understand it a little bit better. Um, and, uh, I, I took off to, uh, actually do a complete master's degree, um, in geomatics uh, at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Um, and yeah, the Netherlands is also awesome. <laughs> it was so fun to live there. Um, ton of expats, a lot of people internationally studying there because you can study in English, um, you know, th thankfully. And uh, yeah, I, I was there for about three and a half years. Um, I got my master's degree in geomatics um, and focused on remote sensing uh, specifically for my, for my thesis um, and brought it back to urban planning and to environment, to, to environmental studies. And um, you know, uh, worked on a, on a research project that was basically asking how how might we use very high resolution multi spectral imagery to um, identify uh, surface permeability, and then utilizing that out that output um, that geographic output to influence urban design decisions, because at the time I was really criticizing. You know, a lot of urban design at the time was purporting to be sustainable, environmentally friendly, or sort of kind of, there was a bit of greenwashing happening um, without the data. 
and so I was thinking, well, could, could we could we could we use the data? How might that influence the design decisions of you know what surface material to use, how to design um, drainage systems, and things like that? So um, I was trying to tie in a lot, all, like all of my interests into that study, um, and that was uh, uh, great. I wanted to publish a paper, never got around to it. Um, uh, it, it is online, um, uh, but that sort of what my appetite into remote sensing um and uh, really under understanding like deeply the challenges around big data big geospatial data um <clears throat> when i moved back to uh I, I moved back to canada after i graduated um there weren't a lot of geomatics or gis jobs in toronto at the time um and so i spent a year actually going back into planning and, and doing parks planning mm -hmm. um which was which was really fun uh, as well. <laughs> so I'm a nomad. I've been I've been around the blog, public, private, um, and yeah, I was I was doing a lot of stakeholder engagement. I was doing a lot of um, you know uh, um, research into how parks were utilized. I was using a lot of uh, geospatial technology in order to get this baseline assessment of downtown parks in Toronto, um, in order to inform future planning policy, parks parks policy. Um, because it was sort of lining up to develop a downtown uh, parks master plan. And um, that's that's when I started to um, gain a little bit uh, of experience in uh, customer engagement um, in user research, because if you think about it from a product perspective, you know, our parks are products, products of the city of city planning. And um, the customers are the citizens. And a lot of those same techniques I transferred into into um, into product, um, but that was really fun because I was I was uh, implementing data collection programs where we um, uh, had a, a team go out into parks and monitor how parks were being used and and turn that into actual geospatial data, uh, and then so we were we're taking that data and helping that to inform the baseline analysis and then therefore um, make suggestions or recommendations on, on public policy. After I did parks planning, I moved to New York um, and then I, I got a job at a company called Arab and they're a construction, architecture, construction, engineering, design company, um, um, a consultancy basically, uh, headquartered in the UK, but you know they have offices ev everywhere, every, every major city you can think of, which was awesome because we did a lot of like offsites at different offices. So I got to travel to a lot of different countries. Um, and worked on really interesting projects there as a geospatial analyst. And um, <clears throat> and these are projects like um, rail engineering projects, water engineering, stormwater management, um, building design, bridge design. So I was working with all the engineers who are doing this all this kind of infrastructure design work, and um, working on the geodata side, which was you know um, <clears throat> going out to collect data of like I would take out like a lidar scanner um, at three in the morning. Um, take the New York City subway to Grand Central Terminal. <laughs> and then it's like, it's a weird time to take the train in New York City. Um, and then go to Grand Central Terminal and like get access to the back of house subway rooms, like where all the m machinery is that that's like taking care of all, all the um, all the systems and like take the LiDAR scanner and scan this, these really complex environments and then go back to the office and turn them into 3D, 3D models that then the engineering engineers use. Um, either to to further model or to re report to the client or like just take as a baseline. It, it can be used in many ways, right? Because it's there's sort of the as is condition. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I was doing that. I was doing just sort of like your standard vanilla um, GIS analysis. Um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, they also give you time to to, to run some projects. So we were doing that. And then my last project there was actually with the New York City Department of um, Environmental Protection, where we um, basically uh, created an impervious, uh, parcel-based impervious map, imperviousness map uh, for the entire city. Wow. So, um, yeah, that, this was this was like an 18 month project and um, they had the aerial data for us to use uh, in order to do that. And so the master's project that I mentioned before, that methodology, I modified it a little bit based on the learnings from that and then applied it to this project so that we could create um, this imperviousness map per parcel. That that data set is available as open data on their open data website now. 
but that was really cool yeah because it was like okay let's let's try to modify the methodology and see if we can do better um <clears throat> it was still hard <laughs> it's a really hard problem to solve to identify surface materiality at a parcel base level um but we did pretty good i mean we reached like 75 percent accuracy for um <clears throat> for the land cover mapping um it still involved like you know we we had to use fme we we also used um, arcgis um and we also did a lot of sort of manual cleanup yeah and then um i was there for about three and a half almost four years uh niantic recruited me um you know i had i had i have friends in san francisco and i was like yeah you know why not i mean sure. uh that relationship i told you about i was like that you know that's that's not going anywhere and i think you know maybe it's time for a change and i hope i think a lot of people can relate to that <laughs> and, um i got the job at niantic as a um and i never thought that i never thought that i would go into gaming yeah it never crossed my mind because like if you come from this traditional gis background it's like you're thinking about like non-gaming applications 200 percent of the time and <clears throat> i was like oh cool like i've been playing pokemon go um since 2016 like central park would be crazy that year i mean it was just like oh my god there's a snorlax and you like it was wild and it was really fun um still had played it at that time that was 2019 when i was recruited and then um i was like oh cool like that's really cool. I mean, of course, of course, it just like dawned on me, like, of course, there's a geospatial team. Like, it is. No, yeah, uh, absolutely. Game, game, the real world map on it. I was like, duh. And then um, when I got the job, I was super excited. I uh, took my two dogs, I invited my parents, and we took a road trip from Manhattan to San Francisco. Amazing. Wow. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Nothing blew up. Nothing happened. Terrible happened. It was like one of the best trips I took with my parents. Um, yeah, especially, you know, now that they're senior, so it was just kind of a nice thing to do together um, and see a little bit of the the, country, the rest of the country. And um, that's what brought me to Niantic. And now I'm I'm here. I've been here for almost three years. Wow. So did you <laughs> Pokemon Go as you went across the country with your parents? Or <laughs> No, I did not. <laughs> they, they would have just been like, what are what are you doing? Just drive. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's very inspirational, especially for folks who might be listening who have a GIS skill set and sort of think that there are sort of very traditional pathways for where that skill set is used. But Niantic is an excellent use case where, you know, you wouldn't, of course, it has a map. Of course, there's a geodata platform, which mm -hmm. I'm excited to hear more about, but you might not understand that there are other opportunities out there. So that's, that's really cool. Yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like really lucky because this job is pretty unique. Um, there aren't a lot of uh, companies out there, especially tech companies that have a lot of these like pro product or or TPM roles in maps, in mapping and geodata. It's pretty rare. And I, I think that's the same case for you as well. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> for true. The maps team, yeah. Yeah, no, it's absolutely accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear now more, a little bit more about the geodata platform. I, I, I've got to say this is ever since we, we emailed back and forth. This interview has been that, one of the highlights. I, I've written so much about Niantic. I'm such a big fan of the company. I'd love to hear more about what the geodata platform looks like, what your day-to-day -day role looks like. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. Um, I could tell you as much as I can tell you. So um, um, yeah, so for, for listeners out there, if, if you've played Pokemon Go or Ingress or um, a couple of our new games, which is Pikmin Bloom, um and if you are in i believe malaysia or singapore you um, may also download our newest ar game which is um <clears throat> peridot and is i cannot wait until it comes to the us but although i have access but um <clears throat> it'll it's going to be so much fun um then you'll know that um you know our mission our mission is to to get people outside right i mean we we want to encourage people to explore the world and um, interact with each other while doing it. And that's at the core of every every product we're trying to build, every product piece, every game we put out there. Um, and and what we encourage our third party developers to do um, who are building on Lightship, um, <clears throat> who basically share that same kind of vision. And um, those are all powered by geospatial data, right? Because it's about going out into the real world and interacting with it, and therefore you need to navigate it and you navigate it through um, the map data that we put in the game. 
Um, so that's that's really important. And um, there are, of course, lots of bits to a geodata platform. Um, if you think about the whole geodata value chain, you have um, incoming geodata sort of into this into the system, right? And then you have all the storage and maintenance that happens. And then you have the delivery of the data or the distribution of the data and, and then therefore applications, right? And so through that process, you have um, value increasing as data passes through, right? <clears throat> And so um, we have different sort of uh, mini teams that focus on each of those um, steps in, in, in the value chain. We have, oh gosh, how many engineers do we have now? I think we have like, we, we grew a little bit this year. So I believe we have like 15 or maybe 19 engineers who work on different parts of that um, and cross-functional partners. Um, but our mission on the platform, Geodata platform team is to get the right type of data in um, store and maintain that data um, to maintain quality and freshness, um, as well as um, taking care of trust and safety, um, and then distributing that in a way that is easy for um, our first party developers like Pokemon Go, or even our third party developers who we just recently opened up to, to, to make it easy for them to utilize that data and create their own um, creative experiences, right? Because we as a platform team don't, don't tell the game teams how to build. So the way that I think about it is that um, we are we're responsible for stocking up this incredible pantry of ingredients, high quality ingredients, um, interesting ingredients um, that that are that are going to inspire creativity um, by the game developers or any any developer who wants to create some sort of real world AR experience. Mm -hmm. So the developers are the chefs we're we're going out there foraging and stocking up the pantry making sure the pantry's organized it has all the ingredients maybe we provide them with some recipes mm -hmm. to get them started but that's that's sort of where our world is and <clears throat> and that as a platform so we're trying to build different platform features to make that easier we're trying to improve the user flows across that um, for me specifically i focus on the data collection piece um, uh, and where where we actually have um, a program called Wayfair, Niantic Wayfair, um, and, and people can Google that later, <clears throat> which is a program that allows high-level Pokemon Go and Ingress players to contribute to the map. Mm -hmm. So it's a community mapping program um, for players where we we invite players to shape their game experience. And I don't know any other gaming company that does that, although I don't really know somebody's going to correct me if they hear this but i don't know yet of a ga another game company that has these real world games like we do um but this is a one-of-a-kind program right and it's very much modeled off of what what happened with google maps as well where it was really all user generated content that created um created the map and so that's what we're doing here and this is um players nominating points of interest um, adding photos, adding descriptions, categorizing it, basically att attributing these locations, objects, and places that then the game teams can use to create interesting things. Um, and I tie this back to trust and safety because at the end of the day, the UGC, user-generated content for the map, that's content, that's still content. And the map itself is content. If we think about it in the social media tech way. Um, it's not geodata, it's actually content. And so we have to think about um, the trust and safety questions around that content. And so I work with that, I work with the trust and safety team on how do we improve um, trust and safety on that content? Do we need more moderation? Do we need more automation? Um, what are the policies within the company that we need to apply to that content? So um, to ensure that we we um, you know we build trust and loyalty with our players and with our end customers, and it feels safe to play, right? Our games are f family friendly, but if someone is submitting and adding map content that is not family friendly, for example, um, that's on us to remove and that's on us to maintain. Um, and also thinking a lot about um, the legality around geodata. That's, that's what I think about a lot as well. When, when I think about what data do we bring in, um, how, how, 
maps maps uh ultimately are about storytelling right this is my thing is like maps are storytelling tools they they tell a perspective each map com, com, a combination of thematic information is telling a story about that landscape about that geography and that therefore leads to questions around politics and territory right maps are used to identify and claim territory um, by certain nation state, by every nation state to say, this is our land. Um, <clears throat> and every country actually has different laws at different levels of maturity um, on how their territory should be represented in, ge in geodata. Um, you know, whether it's a printed map or a digital map, there are laws that say you, you cannot do X, Y, and Z. And if you do, then this happens. And, you know, um, <clears throat> there are a lot of really good examples online if for listeners who are interested. Um, really good stories, really good case studies um, to think about if you're also working in this space that um, the laws around geodata and mapping in the US are certainly not, certainly not the same as those in like South Korea or India or China. Um, even parts of Europe. So you have to think about that too <laughs> as we try to create thematic data sets on the platform that are worldwide, that are global data sets. Um, so global data set doesn't mean equal everywhere. It does and tend to have differences based on the geography and the politics of that place. There, wow. What an interesting role that you have, what an interesting platform. I I feel like you started off talking about your environmental, you know, your environmental background, but at the end of the day, even though I know gaming is very different, you're still getting people out into the environment and appreciating it in a whole way. So I feel like mm -hmm. even though they may seem different, I feel like they do tie in to some extent. I, I yeah. appreciate it at least. Yeah. yeah, I love that connection. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on to my next question. Um, so uh, many of our listeners may not be uh, as familiar with the relationship between the history of Google Maps and Pokemon mm -hmm. Go. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to to hear have you describe that relationship a little bit more. Um, such an interesting and interwined relationship. I'd love to hear hear about it. From you. Yeah, I think um, you know I'm I still consider myself to be fairly new, although some people consider me to be like veteran here i don't know but there are people here who've been here since the beginning with john and are sort of like big fans of john uh hanky and um <clears throat> really you know he's he has this way of sort of drawing people in and um and I, and I think that's what a lot of really great leaders have that quality right that you you have a vision you have a mission and people follow that's that's leadership um and i think um <clears throat> uh a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, he he was involved with Google Maps before Google Maps became Google Maps. <laughs> and I think you know, because you've done, you probably know more than I do if you've done like in depth research. I, I'm here. I am. I'm just like anecdotally repeating what I've heard. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so so um, you know, John was at the head of of Keyhole, and um, for those of you who remember keyhole or were around at that time um or or even today uh have used or have heard of kml the markup language you know back in like when the internet was like cool um and it was a thing uh that's when kml came around it was kind of like oh this made made geodata made, made geospatial data really accessible for people who really weren't gis people and like technicians and analysts like oh i could just use kml it's kind of an easy to use language and i can share and i could start engaging in a dialogue about geodata and for me that that was um that's actually you know the, the way that i experienced it as well and so that was back in i think two 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 thousand and one or something like early like after y2k <laughs> that period um <clears throat> And uh, so, you know, that's just uh, at that at that time that was that was really hot. And um, Keyhole was uh, uh, was then acquired by Google uh, a few years after, I think, 2004, 2005. Um, and then uh, as Google was sort of forming this maps team. Um, and then I think for the next five or so years, um, John's team uh, went on to um, 
build products like Google Maps and Google Earth and Street View. And so they were in this, the, his team was involved in all of, all of those projects. Um, <clears throat> and I think everyone knows what Google Maps and Google Earth and Street View is because we still use those today, like years and years later. Um, <clears throat> and while they were at Google, um, uh, uh, they formed a, a sort of a spin-off research lab, I believe, for, re for research. It was called Niantic Labs. <laughs> and this was sort of like a side project where uh, some computer scientists and some geospatial folks, um, some leaders would get together and um, <clears throat> think about this new mission and this new vision of exploration and, and discovery and going out into the world and exploring it. Like this is sort of their pa passion project. Um, and uh, at Niantic Labs within Google, um, they developed an uh, app called Field Trip. Yeah. And I unfortunately haven't had a chance, hadn't had a chance to experience that uh, back then. I think this was like 10, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, 12 years ago. I'm, I mean, at that time, I was just like in, in planning. I was just starting my planning career. Um, I didn't really know. I wasn't really following a lot. I was, you know, thinking on very serious topics of like urban segregation. <laughs> like, you know, that's where my mind was at at the time. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. And so, Field Trip was this app. It was kind of an experimental app to to see that, like, will this encourage people to go out to the world, explore it? Um, and I think there was a lot of momentum that was built back then. And at this point, I think it was 2010, 2011. There's a lot of momentum built around that, and um, excitement among the team and um yeah and then they um you know this this core group uh led by john um spun out of google um 2012 as niantic labs kept the name um also had the app field trip as well as another game called ingress um at that time so took those two apps with them uh formed a separate company called niantic labs back in 2012 um then started working with uh the pokemon company uh to start thinking about pokemon go um pokemon go was then launched a few years later probably 20 2015 2015 late 2015 uh and then in 2016 kind of blew up right and like that's when i was first introduced to niantic <laughs> was um when everyone was getting excited about like hey remember pokemon now there's a game um and yeah since then like you know that's i think everyone knows the history since pokemon go blew up uh, but uh that's the tie it was all kind of through, through john and his um his sort of mission and vision for using technology to um, get people to explore the world. And there's that thread of geospatial data throughout because maps and geography uh, are ultimately about the human condition and telling the human story and getting people outside. Wow, it's so powerful hearing you, you tell it, especially you're at Atlantic right now, it feels almost historic. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's like a GIS twi Twitter meme where it says, you know, if you're a GIS analyst, try explaining your job without saying the phrase, it's like Google Maps in some, <laughs> in some way or form. I feel like it's just totally. Not. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I explain my, my, my profession to my folks too. They're like, I still don't get what you do. And I'm like, okay, well, think about Google Maps. Think about what goes behind that. And that's it's so true. That's like the starting point. <laughs> Like you don't want to get into the different tile builds and all of these things. It's it's too much. It's just better to yeah. It's different. Yeah. 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 Which is you know if you think about it, that's that's where the impact is, right? Yeah. And um, it's it's always a good starting point for people who are outside of the industries. It's okay. Well, what's the what's the impact to you and to your life? <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 Well, um, last I could literally keep you here all day, but I won't. I have two <laughs> final questions for you. Okay. Um, so to what extent, um, you mentioned you were working um, first in different urban planning settings, and now you're at Niantic. To what extent would you say a computer science oriented skill base is necessary or helpful in work, you know, doing your day-to-day -day work? Um, and do you think that's something that, that um, GIS folks should to try to you know you know embrace more, or do you think it's very essential to your role, for example? Um, 
I think nowadays, if you want to get into geospatial technology, um, even geospatial applications, um, it's always going to be better than not to learn a little bit about computer science. And I don't think that you need to be this, um, you know, stellar programmer or anything, but um, learn a couple of the core languages, um, learn a little bit, of, and you can be self-taught. Right, like you don't have to pay uh, tons of money to go back to college to do this. Uh, I think even just, um, it, well, that depends on the kind of end job you want. But um, as a as a baseline, I think like you know you have to understand um, the the basics of how computers work, how languages work, um, because you have to ultimately, as a GIS analyst or technician or technologist you have to deal with questions or actually do the work to manipulate the geodata. And in order to do that, and in order to understand how transformations work and understand how um, analyses work behind the scenes, like, like, you know, when you click a button, what actually happens, that's gonna help you understand how to, how to identify when um, the data is incorrect or the result is incorrect and how to correct that um, is through understanding the, the science behind it. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's important. I don't think it's absolutely necessary depending on what you want to do, but it will always help you. Yeah. 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 Well, as, as someone who went back to school to get some more computer science, I'm hoping that that, that will help. And, uh, oh, hundred percent. Especially if you, if you are going to be working more closely with, um, tech, uh, for the, for the GIS folks, I'm going to say technologists for tech people, I'll say engineers. Um, if you're not in digital engineering, it's not the bridge engineering I'm talking about, but if you're going to be working with like uh, digital engineers, then um, yes, having a CS background is going to help you communicate with them better and um, uh, with velocity so that you're not kind of feeling lost. <laughs> no, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally. for music to my ears right now. Um, <laughs> Good. For my last interview. So that's sort of just what I want to hear. Let's... You're going to do so great. You're going to do so great yeah. in your new role. <laughs> okay, so I'll get to my last question, uh, which I ask all of my interviewees, uh, which is describe a time where you were lost, whether that's physically um, or metaphorically in life. Mm -hmm. um, I get lost on purpose. <laughs> if anyone was listening to the first 20 minutes, um, <laughs> uh so physically when i travel for example i get lost on purpose and i just thanks to google maps and technology i'm not worried about it and i you know i figure my way around i haven't traveled in two two and a half years um for obvious reasons but um, i'm waiting to get out to it soon once i'm over this uh Ill sickness from covid but um get lost get lost and use your intuition use your gut, use your curiosity and that adrenaline and you'll learn new things and you'll discover things and it'll be much more memorable than doing things that are familiar to you. Um, you have this one life to live, right? So challenge yourself, get lost. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> well, Debbie, thank you. This is excellent. This has been really interesting to hear about your work and uh... I'll hopefully see you around if you're in San Francisco. I don't know a soul I'm moving there for. So I'd love, to, I'd love to grab coffee if you're around. Um, yeah, I would love to do that. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah anyways, um, I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for um, for doing this. This was so much fun.